Welcome, everyone, to Odds and Ends Life Entertainment Theater in the Arts. I am Andrew Kozlowski, and with me is my good friend, world-class bass player, music producer, and co-host, Mr. Cool himself, Mr. Clyde Ballard. Clyde, how are you today? I'm feeling wonderful. How are you doing, man? Hanging in there, man. That's a lot of running around I've been doing lately, but uh, yeah. back in New York and dealing with all this craziness that we're surrounded with right now and uh, trying to make some sense of it. I don't know if I'm doing any good. You got a magic uh, button you can press to explain it to hey, me? I wish I could, and I do do magic. You know that. We'll do that. Yeah, I do. That's why I brought it up. And one of these days, we're going to get you to do something right here. And today, we have a very magical person and a good brother and friend of mine, Billy Ayers. Yeah. We're so connected and Music is just one of the things that connects us, but he's a wonderful person. He's a music therapist and he works with challenged children. Yeah, he's, he's, today. he's quite, quite uh, a, an interesting fella. He's created and directed original plays of all kinds in all kinds of different venues, including homeless shelters, community centers, along with public and private schools, because he has that, that passion. He's created and mastered a technique he uses with children and adults, and he, and he calls it uh, Improvisational Integrated Music and Drama, IIMD. And we'll have Billy on to talk about that in a little while. He's a published songwriter who's sung many national commercials and TV and radio, performed with Ben Vereen and Michael Bolton. Wow. He's worked with many well-known artists, and he's created numerous cartoon voices for Fox 5's children's television show vampires both nationally and internationally he's a trained percussionist a self-taught pianist and a guitarist and but here's the thing he also holds a bs in psychology oh a I member of the screen actors guild oh. and afra and he holds a master's degree in special education as a certified teacher he's developing a series of children's books uh for special needs children and adults entitled the Tiger and the Butterfly, and he's published How to Conduct the Residency for the Westchester Arts Council. Boy, I'll tell you, when I met this guy a couple of years ago, when we honored him at our Josephine Foundation Gala, it was like a, a match made in heaven with the three of us, obviously. Sure. We have the same passions and the same uh, uh, likes and loves. This is going to be a great, great to have yeah. him on board. So, And also, I wanted to say also, a song he wrote, Barbara Streisand heard about it and actually called him. And I think he's going to play a little bit of that song. It was called, Can I Be? The oh, we have, we have a, uh, a piece of that song, I think, uh, that we'll play before we bring him on. So, Gio, yeah. if you've got that lined up, uh, let's take a look at, ladies and gentlemen, Billy Ayers. Given for a life, one instant only to decide, one whisper gaining strength to sing. My moment is waiting in the wings. For once in my life, I have to find the music playing. Once in my day, I have to find the meaning of worthwhile. Can I be the person I was always meant to be? Can I love the way that only I was meant to love? I was meant to see Can I be the person I was always meant to be?
Ladies and gentlemen, award-winning songwriter, artist, and educator, Mr. Billy Ayers. Billy, are you there? There he is. We got him. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Ayers, welcome to our program, Odds and Ends, Life Entertainment Theater and the Arts. We're thrilled to have you with us, my friend. Oh, uh, so great to be here. Thank you. You see our buddy Clyde up there. Yeah. Uh, we're we're all on, and uh, we're thrilled to have you with us today. I, I guess the first thing we're going to ask you uh, that everybody we've been asking is how are you handling this this crazy pandemic and and uh, a lot of the protesting that's going on and the unsettlement uh, around uh, our our world today. Uh, you're a New Yorker, right? You're you're based in New York, and uh, so you certainly are right in the middle of the epicenter of what we're dealing with here. Yeah, um, I uh, I come from New York, and I actually we moved to Connecticut uh, a few years ago, and uh, but I I you know my mom's still in New York. A lot of my programs are in New York and Connecticut, and so uh, I think it's been so hard for everybody, and it's interesting to listen to everybody's um, you know take on what they've been doing. Um, it's uh, scary. I think it's real. I think that it's so confusing sometimes because you don't know what the real facts are, and and uh, and it's been it's been difficult. You know, um, I wear the mask, and we try our very best to uh, you know to do the social distancing thing and to try and uh, uphold what what the authorities have asked us to do. And uh, I, I remember seeing Alan Dershowitz on one night, and uh, he explained it really well. It's not like he said, it's not like they're telling you or, or, you know, ordering you, which a lot of people get that impression, mm -hmm. you know, that we're being ordered to do this and do that, which is, uh, I'm sure some of the officials have that, have that in them. But, but Dershowitz was saying, if, if you, in fact, are going to make or have the ability to make someone else sick, then you should wear a mask because you don't have the right to make them sick. And I thought that was a great way of wording it. Mm -hmm. And after I heard that, I said, geez, I don't want to make anybody sick, you know. Yeah, it's so doggone complicated, uh, Very complicated, especially in a city like New York. I mean, how do you uh, open anything up with the crowds that we have here compared to, uh, like, my other home in, in New Orleans, where they have 500,000 people in the whole greater New Orleans area. Uh, when they, in the, right after Mardi Gras, they were the, the top problem in the country with deaths of, of this pandemic. And then... Within weeks, they were off the charts. They weren't even there anymore because everybody down there did what they were supposed to do and took it very seriously. And uh, and you only have 500,000 people. Uh, sure. Up here, you've got beaches and all kinds of things that, that younger people want to go to. And even though they're not being affected physically, they are the carriers. Uh, and the subways were a big problem, obviously. Uh, and we and it reached our elderly, and uh, of course the problems in the nursing homes. With forty percent of the deaths occurred uh, through the nursing home problems. It certainly was a challenging time. But at, now we, as artists, are all dealing with other issues, and that is that what we do is not, uh, while it's probably needed more than it's ever been needed before, and our programs needed more than it's ever been needed before. We're in a situation where. It doesn't look like we're going to get to work until after the first of the year. If then, Broadway just uh, decided that they're not even going to try to come back until January. And, and we have a funny hunch. That's looking at it very uh, brightly because without a, a vaccine of some kind, I don't know how anybody's going to go into a theater. Right. Very, very difficult. So, uh, you know, what, what uh, I know you have, I wanted to start with your earlier years, but let's, let's, I think people are interested in what we have to say about things like this. So what's your feeling on, on that? You know, uh, I think that, um, one of the agencies I work with now was asking, uh, if I could, if we could do programs outside, which would be, which of course is, you know, um, the outdoor dining and the, everything that's happening outdoors because the virus has, much less of a chance of uh, of getting you if you're if you're outside, um, but that also brings more complications because you know to do programs for children is what you know, which is what I do now. Um, also songwriting, but but um, 
you know, many, many programs for children with special needs and adults and traumatic brain injury survivors. Um, to do that outside, you, you need some kind of a huge tent and you still need to, to have the distance. So, um, you know, for now, we're doing a lot of Zoom. Uh, you know, because of the technology, we're able to connect. A lot of these children really are locked in their homes. They're locked in their, some of them have group homes. Some of them ha are living at home. Um, and they really need to connect. They need to see you. They want to see you. And uh, the technology gives us a way to do that, which is a real blessing. Uh, thank God for that. Um, so, so sometimes we, on a Zoom, we can have up to 50 people on a Zoom, which is really funny because, you know, they want to all get in. Uh, so I said, we should really split it up, you know, and do, do two classes of, uh, of 25. So I'm sure that a lot of people across the country and across the world are using this technology and, and FaceTime and other technologies, uh, similar to this to connect because connecting with each other is so vital and we we really need to stay connected that's really my feeling um yeah. hearing you and seeing you and 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 you know the second best thing to being near you is to hear you and see you and to know that you're still there and to know how you still feel and to hear your voice and um it's it's really the second best thing clyde wouldn't you think that that's important absolutely i was going to ask, ask you also ask you uh how many children are you still actively involved with? Because um, that's a great question. Um, the normal, my normal flow of, of individuals is about 300 a week. Whoa. And, um, and there's only one of the agencies I work for who uh, <clears throat> some, uh, most of the children and young adults in that agency are, are very severely um, some, some of whom have autism, they're, they're, they're really, this agency has, uh, their hands full because the, uh, the kids have, uh, you know, a hard time with their issues. They, they have severe issues. And so for that reason, it's very difficult for them to even think of sitting in front of a, uh, you know, a camera or a computer or a device for an extended period of time. Um, they would need, uh, supervision they, and they, and they probably couldn't sit there for more than 10 minutes, you know, and, but, uh, conversely, some of them, uh, I don't know how many people are aware, but many, many children and, and, uh, adults who have autism are very, very amazingly talented with devices and technology. And some of the uh, professionals feel that it's because the technology is very predictable so that if I do a certain thing on my tablet I, I get the same response every time so it's it's predictable unlike human beings we're not predictable um, I don't know what Clyde's gonna say I don't know what Andrew's gonna say and um, I don't know what Gio's gonna say but I do know what my iPad will say <laughs> yeah. and uh, and for that reason they become fluid and uh, wonderful at those. So there are a bunch of them that are very great. But that one agency is the only one who I don't currently serve, which which probably is about 60. So it's probably, you're looking at probably around 250 people a week um, on on Zoom right now. Well, let's Before we get into that a little bit, before we get into Billy's work, uh, right now let's let's give the people out there uh, uh, a little view of what billy was like and how he got to where he did uh let's talk about his youth a little bit where you grew up where you went to school your family structure and how you got involved in music and, uh -huh. and then maybe you can talk a little bit about the transition from the arts or using the arts it's the way i like to say it sure and, and using it to uh get involved and help uh, the children that you're getting involved with so greatly today. You you really, in many ways, you and I do a lot of the same thing. We, we went yeah. from the art to education, and, and we have foundations that are moving in that direction. So let's give people out there uh, uh, a view of, of how this all started. Your youth, okay. where you grew up, your family structure, your schooling, uh, the music, how did you get interested in that stuff and writing? And, and then we'll go on to uh, how that transitioned over to sure. what you're doing today. 
Sure. Well, I'm an only child, um, born in New York City, and uh, uh, family lived in uh, in Forest Hills for the first four years of my life, and then moved to uh, New Rochelle in Westchester County, and um, was raised in, in New Rochelle. So um, instead of uh, public school, I went to uh, parochial school. I went to Catholic school, Holy Family Grammar School, which... Um, Another one, Clyde. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> by the time uh, by the time I was in the sixth grade, my mother um, my mother was a uh, learning disabilities specialist, and she was working in uh, one of the local public schools uh, at, at the time, and transitioned to uh, my school. So mm -hmm. so when when I was in the sixth grade, my mother became the fifth grade teacher in my school, which was a little bit weird. Now, Billy, when you say special needs, they didn't have special ed in those days, right? They, they did. Oh, they did. They did. Because my years in school, I'm a little older than you are, and and uh, they didn't have special ed. They had special needs, but mm -hmm. not special ed. They didn't. I think she was pretty. Them. She was on the cutting edge of the uh, the beginning of it, and mm -hmm. um, you know, she was. Um, she, because I remember her being a special ed, uh, you know, person at Daniel Webster, which was up the road from us. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know why she would have transitioned into the public, because then eventually, years and years later, she transitioned back into public. And be and uh, she actually, she became the pr principal of Holy Family Grammar School. And that happened after I was out, thank God. Mm -hmm. um, there was one, um, and, and I was always, I was always a very... Um, I, I loved I loved people. Um, I still am, you know, very much a people person. Um, you know, one of my gifts is that uh, I can connect with people, um, you know, of all kinds. And and you spoke about that earlier. Um, I my parents raised me n never to see color and never to see anything about a person except for the person. And, 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 you know, I guess I had that natural gift because of, uh, I always was able to see the talent in a human being. In other words, even early on, when I, I started working with special needs children early on, I could still tell the talent of that person and see that before I saw anything else. And of course the world was always seeing the disability um, because that's the way our world is. It's, it's very strange that way. But um, so mom came the, became the principal. Uh, I was, uh, I was, I consider myself a very late bloomer. And what I mean by that is finding yourself, understanding who you are in the world. I think that, uh, you know, Socrates, was it Socrates that said, know thyself? Mm -hmm. It's a very hard road to, to know thyself, you know? Um, yeah. Sometimes it's a scary thing to know thyself, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, He's being I, very quiet, our buddy there, you notice? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I know a lot about the day. <laughs> He's a, very much the philosopher, Clyde, I think, right? Yes, indeed. Wow. He, he, uh, if, I, if I need to bounce something off uh, someone, he's the best person to think of. Wow. Now, when did music enter into the picture? So I think that I was always a person who, um, who was playing the drums with, my, with the pencils in my hands. I was always... I was, you know, whether that was, um, you know, they call a person who can't focus attention deficit. And, and my, you know, my take on attention deficit is very different because when I was doing that with the pencils my whole life, um, it wasn't so much that I was, uh, had a deficit. And, and these children who are not paying attention are a lot of times bored. And a lot of times they have, like, like you and I and Clyde, they have that artist, that electric mind. And Clyde talks about it a lot, the electric mind, which is the ability to hear something, see something in the back of your mind, in the corner of your eye, hear something else. At the Everything's happening holographically. It's not happening in a linear fashion so that... You know, you're seeing and hearing a lot of things in, in, a, in, the, in one way that people are not understanding about you so of course if you're not paying attention to the teacher you're you have a deficit that's the way they view it which is so interesting to me that they would see that um instead of seeing wow he's he may be bored um uh, so you know give that same attention deficit kid uh, a computer game and watch the, watch where the uh, attention deficit goes out the window 
you know, for because they're, they're on the computer game for an hour. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I was always fumbling around with the pencils. Uh, I remember in sixth grade when my mother was still the uh, teacher in the fifth grade. Um, one day we had to wear uniforms, by the way, Holy Family uh, School. And the kids all, and we had HFS, and some of the kids said Hitler's firing squad. You know, that was the that was the uh, the crazy way the kids would look at it because we were still made to have uniforms and so on and so forth. But one day I wore a um, I wore a tie clip that had a door knocker on it. It was a, so I I had a door knocker and I put a little sign over that said "Please use back door." And Sister uh, Patricia Ann didn't like that too much, so she uh, she said, "Mr. Ayers, come with me." And she brought me down the hall. It's Mrs. Ayers. We have a slight problem here, uh, and she showed me. She showed my mother the you know the little thing I put on my you know my mother. Oh, I can't. You know, it was one of those. So so it was. Uh, it was really weird to have your mother in, as a teacher well, down the hallway. I imagine that must have been interesting. <laughs> but uh, thank God, they um, when I was 11 years old, I was surprised with a drum set. Mm. And um, so the pencils turned into drumsticks, and uh, and they also got me. They were they were really good. Uh, they got me drum lessons with a uh, with a jazz. Um, Johnny Strauss, may he rest in peace. He was he had played with Paul Whiteman, and he was um, he was a jazz player, and um, he taught me how to read drum music. And um, every time he would do a fancy thing, I say I can't do that, and he say Don't say I can't. And by the time he left, I was doing it. Yeah. He was a great teacher, and um, so I started on the drums. And then you know, in high school, started getting. I had a we had a band in high school. And I was the drummer, and uh, we had a couple of guys. Uh, I went to high school at Fordham Prep. I went to uh, Jesuit High School, and um, I didn't. Uh, I took. I was always really bad at big tests, so the co-op. I did horribly at the co-op. I wanted nothing more than to go to Iona Prep, and um, and I didn't get in because my co-op score was was so low. Um, I would always uh, again, you know, another example of um, of of measuring or or testing a person in a, in such a way that is is like you know putting them in a box you know and i you, you can learn so much from that because um i learned a lot about what not to do from education yeah. and how not to educate a child and how you know and was it mark twain that said don't let uh, school get in the way of your children's education was that him well billy you and i have had a conversation many times about what we feel about how the arts are used in education and and the, the problem that we have in Clyde, I can't even tell you how many times Clyde and I have talked about, because uh, I get frustrated with, you see teachers today, not teachers, but administrators. And and sadly, also in the parochial schools, they're, they're there, they're present, and they're, they're tunnel vision. Everybody believes that STEM is the answer to education. And now, as you saw two weeks ago, the president of the United States signed an executive order, which tells us that the federal government will start looking at skill set rather than a piece of paper That's great. to decide who they're going to hire, meaning they're going to focus to vocational uh, studies. Uh, and, and I had been trying to tell people this for years, that, that you, one of the things I had, had problems I had with the Catholic schools was that in high school... If you're not going to college, the Catholic schools say they have nothing to do with you. We'll prep you to go to college, but that's it. So in other words, if you have a kid, a good kid that is a Catholic, but isn't going to college, well, we don't have anything for you. We're done. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I can tell you this. They wouldn't be having financial problems if they had vocational studies. I can tell you that for sure. More than they ever, woodworking and and plumbing and arts, uh, you know. Uh, think about sound engineers, all kinds of things you could put into those programs that kids who are not going to college could start to learn a skill. And you know, it's not like they're not making a great living either. Carpenters, one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to start. Compare that to the balance that we have with a police officer going in at twenty nine thousand dollars a year. The first year that they go in, crazy. They're Just putting their lives on the line, especially in the environment we're in today. So we've had this discussion about the arts, and and how close-minded some educators are, 
and it's it's really hurting uh, the program. But what they can't touch is what you're doing, and that's the uh, reaching of children and adults who have certain handicaps or 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 are being perceived wrongly because of our education system is not reaching them in the traditional methods. And we use the art, music, to to reach our our students. Absolutely. And you've Absolutely. been on the forefront of this. You have a special gift in reaching children because what you do requires a lot of discipline, dedication, and love. And I know sometimes it's frustrating. Oh, I, I, I know it's got to be frustrating for Billy, too. It's frustrating sometimes dealing with challenged children. Um, let me just tell you, uh, can, if I can answer that, um, so one of the groups I have, uh, are, have, uh, are children with emotional, young children with emotional issues, um, with an organization called Ability Beyond. That's a phenomenal organization and the people there, you know, when you, like when Andrew, uh, is, is doing these programs for children when i'm doing these programs for children we, we don't we don't realize how many people are connected to the children and to you know there are hundreds and hundreds of people that that you know when you throw a pebble in the in the ocean you know how the how it vibrates it and how it ripples right it's it's just we don't realize how the vibrations uh are affecting other people so one day I was at, <clears throat> I think this is the best way to answer the question. Uh, one, of the, one of the young adults, she's 24 years old, uh, living in a group home, no contact with her parents uh, for whatever reason. And um, when, when I bring equipment to these programs, I bring a full set of drums, a piano, a PA system, microphones, 30 percussion instruments, uh, as many things as possible, because we don't know, as artists and educators, we don't know what is going to open up a person. And our society can only focus on what we cannot do. So think about think about that and growing up, Andrew. How many times did you hear, well, you can't do this and you can't do that? And Clyde, you're really not good at this. Did they, did they look at what you were good at? Did they look at what Andrew just said? There was an executive order just signed to look at the skills in other words, when you look at the gifts that a person has and try to uncover them, that is the magic wand right there of connection so that a person doesn't even know what they're good at many, many times, especially a young person. So there are things in you and in me that we have not explored yet. And that's how I, that's how I proceed. So if we are talking about the limitlessness of your abilities, we are talking about something that is almost cosmic. We are talking about the possibilities that exist. You may be a great sculptor and not even know it because we don't talk about those things. We talk about the things that we can't do and that we're, we're not wearing the right pair of shoes. We're not, we're, what did you wear that for? What, how, we look at the person and we're very limited in what, how our society views things. So, so Shandrika, is this, I just love this kid. I love the children I work with. And, and, and I think one day I asked her, would you try this, try to sit down at the drums? Okay. So she sat down at the drums and, and, you know, Andrew, the way I teach the drums is with money and, and the drums are math. Music is math. It's not just important. It is math. It is directly connected to math. It is directly connected to language. It is directly connected to poetry and to rhythm and to rhyme and to walking and to talking. It is directly interconnected. And for people not to realize that about the arts is just plain ignorant. Yeah. Yeah. Billy, 
let's that's, talk a little about your you you mastered a technique, you created a technique, and I think it, right. correct me if I'm wrong, improvisational integrated music and drama. Right. That's that's really the if you were to give it a clinical name, uh, I once had a lawyer uh, who's a wonderful artist as well, view the class. She stayed in the class, <clears throat> one particular class for 16 straight weeks. She was just in awe. She, she just fumbled into the classroom by accident. She said, what is this? And I, and I said, because Karen, my dear friend, who's a music therapist and a professor at NYU, who I've been working with for 18 years, she's a dear friend. She's a brilliant, absolutely brilliant person and a brilliant music therapist, well, more than a music therapist, said once uh, about me that uh, you're much more than music, you're much more than a music therapist because you connect with everyone. You're doing things way beyond music therapy, which is, uh, you know, of course, nice to hear. Uh, but she also said, you have to name what you're doing or else people won't understand what it is that's happening because people will not, you have to educate them. While it's happening, you have to point out what is happening. You know, some people will say, oh, isn't that nice? He does music with special needs kids. Well, you know what? There's so much more happening on so many different levels uh, that you're, you're doing something that is almost the equivalent of, of freeing the slaves, I mean, so to speak, because these people are enslaved by society, as were women, as were Native Americans, as were African Americans. We do the same thing to many different groups of people. I mean, we do it to special needs people. We consider them less. That's what society. That's how society views them. So when you take out twenty five, I, I would take twenty five cents, uh, four quarters, and put it on a poster board, um, and equals a dollar. And every child, even children with neurological problems, know a dollar <laughs> because it's money, <laughs> and everybody knows money. So. So here we go, four quarters. We're going to say that one quarter note sounds like this, boom. And I show them at the drums, wham, that's one. So we're gonna do your right hand and your right foot at the same time. Everybody says time, I said, yes. Now let's see if you can play your right hand on the hi-hat and I explain to them what the you know parts of the drums are and your right foot on the bass drum and this is how it sounds. And so you're observing, and I'm telling them at the same time, I'm going to watch how you learn when we do this. And we're going to see if you learn, and you're going to teach yourself and me about how to go on this journey. You're going to teach me. You're the teacher here. You're thinking that I'm the teacher. And she's looking at me like I'm crazy. So in one minute, Shandrika does a straight four beat. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. She does the beat. I said, you did that in one minute. And all of a sudden, Shandrika stands up and she stares at me. I said, what, what? What's the matter? She's looking at me. I said, Shandrika, you want to tell me something? She says, yeah. I said, what is it? She said, I can't read. I said, Shandrika. The system failed you. She said, what? I said, the system failed you. Do you think after all those years that I could penetrate what they had done to her in one minute? Not, not likely. I said, Shandrika, let me explain to you something, okay? This is really, you're, you're teaching me something and I'm trying to give it back to you. Listen to me. Listen to me, what you just did shows you what? I don't know. I said, okay, what you just did means that when your brain gets presented to it, something that you understand, you see, you're a concrete thinker and that's, that's just like me. You see, when, when they used to write things on the board that we call abstract, and I'll show you what that means, they don't really mean anything other than the meaning that we apply to them. So I showed her one over five on the blackboard. What does that mean? I don't know. I said, okay, it's a fraction, but you understand the concrete version of what that is. You understand the actual doing of it. And I showed her, and you know, in graduate school, um, Dr. Matthew Clark, uh, God bless him, 
uh, showed us how to teach math to children. And um, he, he said, what is one over five? And he asked everybody in the graduate, this is a graduate school class in education and in special ed. He said, what is the one in one over five? Do you know that every single person said it's the numerator? And he screamed, no. <laughs> he, he said, what does the one stand for in one over five? It stands for how many? One. And he said, we're going to talk about five as it's the if it's a family. So that we're going to talk about math as a language, like music is. It's a language. And give, let me tell you something. These children understand the language of music. They understand it. It's, it's intuitive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's our way in. That's our connection. That's it. So many times that's it. Not every time, because sometimes they understand art. Right. Drawing. Sometimes they understand sculpture. Sometimes they understand dance. Sometimes they understand poetry. I have a, a, a young lady who is one of my idols, who is one of the greatest poets I've ever witnessed in my life. And I'll read you one of her poems, Katie Cavallaro. She's, I, I think that Katie and Sterling, two, two unbelievable people I, I have in my life, were, were, are, are definitely... They're, I don't know if they're from this world. I'm not sure. But when I read you the poem, you'll tell me how many people you know that write like that or that think like that. So, so I say to Shandrika, Shandrika, what happens when I gave you something that your brain understands? What did you do? You did it in one minute. So that means to me that if you have somebody who works with you on learning how to read, and if they present the material to you the way that your brain needs, guess what you're going to do? You're going to read. A mode of operation. That's okay. So, 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 that's, so, Clyde, I know that's a really long way to answer your question, and I apologize. No, you did. But, you, you did. but, it's, but, it's, but it frustrates me only to not the children or not the person frustrates me, but what they've been subjected to and what they've been brainwashed to about themselves. Right. Yeah, Billy, I, you know, when I talk to people about it in, in uh, government, all right, and again, you know I've been to Albany, Washington, D.C. I talk all the time about they can't cut. Clyde knows my frustration because most of the time when I come back from talking to some of these guys, it's guys like Clyde that I talk to to just get it all off my chest, and I'm, I'm in a mood that's ridiculous. They don't comprehend because their attitude is they've got so many kids they got to take care of that their system is set up to take care of the masses in numbers, not quality. So the idea that they could connect with someone on a different level is never thought of. Their attitude is we have one way to do this. We have a large group we have to do it with. And off we go. And then you see all these other things like, well, we can't have more than 30 in a class. We right. can't do this. We can't do that. I'll never forget. We were at St. Mary's in Manhasset the first year we were there. And many of the teachers didn't like the fact that we were coming in to do this program. Uh, they looked at us as like uh, an unnecessary evil. Wasn't going to enhance uh, academia at all in their mind. Mm. Because, again, they were narrow-minded. They didn't understand. But worse yet, we had 60 kids sign up for the theater class. 60. So we put them in the auditorium. And the teachers, all they kept saying to each other was, just wait until he sees how difficult it's going to be to talk to 60 kids. So I used to get a number of teachers would walk to the back of the auditorium with their mouths hitting the floor. Because I had the same kids that were talking and riling up in their classes, their math classes, their English classes, their science classes, the ones that would be disrespectful to them at times. In my class, they were sitting quietly with discipline, and they wanted discipline. But it was about the mode of operation, the connection. And you gave them respect. That's right. As soon as they get it back, they, they give it back to you. If they have to earn it, I want them to do the things that they're supposed to do. And on that level, it's a little different than what we're talking about with some children that we deal with, uh, because you have to be a little more patient with kids that have special needs. But artists, you know how they are. 
it's hard to keep their attention sometimes. I had them for two and a half hours a day. <laughs> and I, I didn't have a problem with 60 kids. Right. There's a reason for that. It has to do with the mode of operation. Absolutely. How you connect, what you're connecting with. And then you can teach them anything. Anything. As you well know. Once you have that door open, the flow of information is tremendous. I'll never forget the first time I introduced Clyde to some of these kids. And they saw him play the bass. First, they see the guy, Mr. Cool, comes in, you know, he's... He's dressed, he's to the nines, you know, and he's got his, his instrument and the way he gets himself prepared and, and that whole thing. And they're all watching him. You know, this is a unique thing to keep your eye on. And then how many of them wanted to do what he does? It just, it clicks. Beautiful. Whereas before it's not cool, all of a sudden it connects. Right. Right. And it really is. I have to ask you this question. Now, you did something that I did instrumentally. You taught yourself guitar and piano. I never took a lesson in piano and guitar, and I can play classical guitar now. But uh, I taught myself this. Now, this system that you created, uh, did you did that come from your learning those instruments, maybe? Or did that really happen before you really started to think about? And how- Billy, is it related to what Oliver Sacks was doing? Or is it a completely different technique? Is it your own technique that you devised? It, that's a great question. Those, those are great questions. Um, it's my own technique. And, and um, it, it is created specifically from a need. The need... Uh, now I'm, I'm sure that a lot of the Oliver Sacks is amazing. He was amazing. He passed away a while ago mm-hmm. and, uh, he was doing wonderful, wonderful things as was Clive Robbins, who, uh, Clive Robbins brought music therapy to this country and he, and Karen, my friend who I mentioned earlier was basically his protege. So at NYU, she was studying under Clive. And, uh, so I was really benefiting from that because, here I'm working with Karen. So, and she saw me working and, and um, what I was creating was from listening to the needs of who I was working with, with whom I was working, I should say, the needs. So if, if Shandrika, for example, needs to have you expose a talent that she did not know was there. That's what she needs. In other words, it's up to you now to try and expose the talent. And and what it involves is another piece. After you expose the talent that is unknown to the person, and you can do it with 30 people in the classroom, as Andrew knows, and 60 he had, he just explained. You can do it with 30 people. What you're looking for is a talent, a skill, something that you can do better than anybody else can do or just as good as anybody else. And once you expose that talent, you are going to, uh, you are going to build the person's self-esteem by recognizing and by emphasizing that Wow, Clyde, did you see what you just did? Now, with children with special needs, a lot of times you are the mirror. You are the mirror for them to see themselves for the first time, which is amazing, dramatic. It is life-changing. Yeah. It is unbelievable. And really what's happening is enlightenment is happening before your very eyes. It is real and it's magic. And Clyde, you know what magic is because you do it. This is real, real magic. And and so the child is looking at you and with this expression, that's me. That's me singing that beautiful song. That was me. I did it. I And, and, and you know, Andrew, to build the self-esteem of a human being is one of the greatest honors in my life because... Yeah. What you're seeing is a different person than who walked in the door. Right. Now you're seeing a person who can do things that they never thought were possible. Now what is going to happen? Wow. I can now use that instrument or my voice or, or, and, and so the more you listen, the better it gets. The more you provide 
as many things as possible to unlock the better it gets. So I bring markers, I bring paper, I bring poster board, I bring, I go crazy. I go nuts because I know that they need to go nuts in a good way. They need an environment where they can just, I said, we're going to go crazy today. And the very first song I wrote was Sterling. Sterling is one of the most, if not the most unbelievable person I've ever met in my life. He was diagnosed with a NF1 brain tumor when he was 18 months old that made him go blind. And he is the most positive person I've ever met. We've written probably, he, well, we, his parents never knew that he was an artist and a songwriter. They may have knew he had, they may have known that he had artistic tendencies, but he came to me at nine years old. And uh, what he needed to do was, you know, I needed to help unlock him. And, and what he needed to do was let go and go crazy in a good way, which is what we all need. Creatively, go crazy, go nuts. What does that mean? Now, it's a part of the technique, Andrew, because once you unlock something, whoa, be careful what you ask for. So, yeah. so I said to Sterling, Sterling, what you need to do is you, you love the, you, you sit at the drums. You sit, so why don't you sit at the drums and I'll sit at the piano? Okay. So I said, well, well why don't we just go crazy, go nuts? Why don't we just go nuts? He says, what, what? What, what, well, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me show you. Okay, here it is. Ready? One, two, three. And so I really went nuts. And so I showed him what going nuts is within certain parameters. Okay. Now, whether you're, um, you know, uh, uh, whether you're a uh, tight end or whether you're a receiver on a football team, you, you can go nuts too in your own way, but you still have that, you know, if you go out of bounds, you're out of bounds. So you still have a parameter that you're working under. and uh, But within that parameter, you can free yourself to a certain degree. So so we started playing the song. I said, you know what? what? We should call this Chaos. So we our first song we wrote together was called Chaos. And in the video that uh, Sterling had a film made about him from Stephanie Angel, who is a real amazing film director, and her sister passed away from the same brain tumor that Sterling had. And she promised that she would have children direct their own films who had these brain tumors and give them a film just so that they could have all their own. And uh, Stephanie and I worked together on, on a video. And we all, I was also in this film that she, she made about Sterling. And there's a part where he's actually playing uh, Chaos. And, and at the end... I said, that's rock and roll. And he just has this beautiful expression of smiling. Yeah. He goes, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, We're going to talk a little bit more about that. We're going to take a little break right now. Okay. Uh, and we'll be right back uh, to talk more with Billy Ayers, everybody. I saw the sun coming through the rain out there. And it dawned on me that there must be a rainbow somewhere. There must be a rainbow out there. Cause the sun near was shining while the rain was still blinding so there must be a rainbow somewhere there must be a rainbow somewhere I'm telling you A big time thanks to our special guest tonight and very, very special man, our good friend, Mr. Billy Ayers. Clyde, we are going to have to bring him back and do just a segment on on his uh, special program that he's working with all these children. Uh, I think we'd have a good time going over there and, and getting some work from him there and, and seeing and how that's going to more about his songwriting because he has some incredible, incredible songs. He's oh, written. yeah. And, that, and we could always spend days just sitting there listening to him play all the songs he's written. Folks, don't forget to join us next week. 
when our special guest will be a man who starred in the original Broadway production of Dreamgirls with Jennifer Holliday and then reprised the role uh, that Sammy Davis had in Golden Boy. Uh, he also toured with such stars as Liza Minnelli. We're talking about actor, dancer, singer, musician, star of Broadway, film, and TV, Mr. Oba Babatandi. And this is a show you certainly don't want to miss. Stay advised of all the events by following the Josephine Foundation on our Facebook page and our Instagram account. On behalf of my good friend, Mr. Clyde Ballard, our producer, Mr. Gio Vitozzi, and myself, peace, strength, and love until we see you next week in Odds and Ends, Life Entertainment, Theater, and the Arts. A belated happy 4th of July to all. Good night, everybody. Stay bright.